Hello, and happy Monday to you on this August the 7th, 2023. This is the 26th lesson in the 2023 Everett Hodges Archive Series. It is a lesson from Sunday, August the 10th, 2003, and it is titled, Do We Need Another Gospel? Our objective in being here is that it be well with our souls. That's why the title of the lesson today, Do We Need a New Gospel or a New Age? Peter said, The word of the Lord abides forever. Paul said, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and in the love which is in Christ Jesus. There can be no doubt that we live in a new age. There have been phenomenal changes over the last 100 years, even the last 25 years. For instance, 100 years ago, the average life expectancy in the United States was 47 years. Today, it's almost 80. 100 years ago, only 14% of the homes in the United States had a bathtub. Only 8% had a telephone. There were only 8,000 cars in the United States, 144 miles of paved road. There are more cars than that between here and Sherman every day today. The average wage in the United States was 22 cents an hour. Sugar cost 4 cents a pound. Eggs were 14 cents a dozen. Coffee was 15 cents a pound. You had to make your own bread or get milk from the dairy because there were none in the stores. Most women only washed their hair once a month and they used borax and egg yolks for shampoo. So we live in a new age. Things have changed. Not only that, but we've seen advancement in invention and technology. We're able to put men and equipment in space and on the moon. We've even explored Mars. And we're able to sit in our living rooms and watch a picture of an event live that is taking place continents away. We live in a new age. And the trend continues. By the time that we get used to operating DVDs and CD players, there will be something else along to take their place. And we'll have to learn all over again. New age indeed. I have a 1998 iMac computer. Can't buy parts for it because it's obsolete. Five years old and obsolete. But do we need a new gospel for this new age? In order to keep pace with the times, do we need to somehow streamline our religion? To hold to the faith of our fathers, is it failing to advance with civilization? Should we continue to preach the same old Jerusalem gospel, or should we change to keep pace with an ever-changing society? Well, some say that we must change. Lee Anderson in 1990 said in a book called Dying for Change, he said that churches must change to meet the challenge of the current generation or die. Rapid and complex changes in Western society have left many established churches teetering between ineffectiveness and extinction. publication called Wineskins that is edited and contributed to by Rubel Shelley and Mike Cope and John York and a few others has said in the last few years brethren have argued that traditional churches of Christ are not uh, who are unwilling to make doctrinal changes will eventually cease to exist in 2001 they say Randy Harris argued that the coming generation will not understand love for God in terms of getting it all right but in relational and experiential terms. He predicted that if all we have to offer is arguments for church government, weekly observance of the Lord's Supper, acapella music, and baptism for the remission of sins, we have no future 
or they're not interested. Their interest is in authentic relationship and the church is not fed by such arguments. So what is the future of the religious movement that has the identity I outlined? Churches of Christ are certainly not going to disappear overnight. It will be less cataclysmic, than, but no less tragic. One group defending tenaciously the position that we do indeed have it all right will become increasingly marginalized, strident, then irrelevant, and just fade away. That's from an article that's titled, Will Churches of Christ Survive the 21st Century? in that new wineskins publication in 2001. More recently, Rubel Shelley and John York have argued that there is a longing today that will, to that will not tolerate exhaustive or exclusivistic claims. And they say, ironically, any group claimed to be the only Christians in our time will become a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. Such intolerance will lead to isolation that will become extinction. Now, folks, we need to understand that these are words not coming from the world, but coming from some who claim to be our brethren. And it's tragic. They go on to say, we no longer hold that immersion in water for the remission of sins is the one baptism of the New Testament, Ephesians 4, verse 5. We can no, long, no longer understand the one body or church of Christ has only one gospel, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, and one faith, Ephesians 4, verse 5, and Jude 3. We are urged to view the body of Christ relationally rather than doctrinally if we are to survive the postmodern era. To exclude anyone on the basis of doctrine suggests intolerance and violates the most basic postmodern value. Everyone's truth is equally valid. This philosophy is not entirely new. Well, it's not new at all. A writer said in the late 60s said that real disciples are always on the move toward widening horizons. They cannot walk permanently with company whose eyes are turned backward. And from that same book, we read the Church of Christ has its eyes on the past and is more concerned with old paths than in directing people to paths they can follow successfully in a modern, in a modern age. But you know what? I like what Jeremiah said when he said, Seek the old paths and walk in them, for therein is the good way. Don't abandon the old paths. Seek the old paths and walk in them, for therein is the good way. A preacher for the disciples of Christ said, and I quote, But as great as the Bible is, it is not enough to exhaust the meaning of Christ for Christian faith. Once we learn of him through the Bible, we will continue to see him beyond the sacred page. The Bible was never intended as a detailed blueprint of faith and practice. End quote. But Paul said all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for instruction or for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Does the gospel preached by Holy Spirit-led apostles meet the need of modern world? It met the needs of, a, of ancient men. It enabled Jesus to be victorious over Satan in Matthew chapter 4 when he was tempted of the devil three different times, each time he said it is written and he quoted scripture. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse 11. It brought a transformation of life to Jesus' disciples. In John 15, 3, Jesus said, You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Those men were fishermen and tax collectors and, and other kinds of things. But that word that Jesus spoke transformed them into apostles and inspired men of God. Not the new age philosophy, but the word of God that abides forever. 
It melted the hearts of those on Pentecost when Peter stood and preached to them that gospel for the very first time. It melted their hearts so that they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you. And they did. Acts 41, uh, 241 says that as many as received the word were baptized and there were added in that day about 3,000 souls. And so 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost recognized the power of the Word and that the Word told them what they needed to do, and they did it. And the number came quickly to be 5,000, and then multitudes were added, and the church grew. That same gospel today brings the same question. And that same gospel brings the same answer and it brings the same results to those who follow and obey that gospel. It's never been changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Paul, in writing to those brethren in Corinth, said to them, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, and neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. They were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same gospel that we preach today and that we must preach today if those same kinds of people and their multitudes of them are going to have their sins washed away today. The gospel gave hope beneath trials and burdens. Paul said, I am hard pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And then later in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, he said, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith, and so there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing simple gospel of Christ met the spiritual needs of men of the 19th century as they forsook as they forsook doctrines and traditions and creeds of men in favor of the apostolic gospel and we read in history about men like Abner Jones and Elias Smith and Barton W. Stone and James O'Kelly and the Campbells and others who chucked all of that denominational nonsense that they had learned and they, they cast it all aside and they went all the way back to the old time scriptures. They went back to the New Testament. 1900 years old, but they went back to it nevertheless and saw it as the means by which man would be saved. The result was that multitudes accepted the pure and simple gospel of Christ as their only guide in religion, and they were Christians only. Disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him glorify God in this name. Agrippa said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. No other connotation, no other hyphenated name added to that, just Christians. That old restoration movement slogan that Bible only makes Christians only is still valid. But this is the 21st century, the space age, and we're told that the gospel alone is not effective anymore. And the result is that preachers are quoting from philosophers and researchers and great orators instead of Peter, James, and Paul. Jude said, contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered, once for all time, once for all men delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. 
Again, Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Seek the old paths and walk in them, for therein is the good way. Does the gospel meet the needs of modern man as it did those in ancient times and those a hundred years ago? I believe four questions will help us answer that question. First of all, has man changed? The answer is no. Man has not changed physically. Man is as he's always been. Flesh and blood and bones and the, and the needs to sustain him are the same as always. There's water, air, and food. Those are the necessities of life. They were when man was created and they have been ever since and they always will be. Whatever else we may have, we must have air, food, and water in order to live. That's not changed in any way. You can't get by without any one of those. There's no need to add anything to those in order to sustain life. Man's not changed. From creation it's been true, and no matter what changes come, those needs will always be the same. We have different sources for those things. We have a more availability sometimes of some of those things, but they nevertheless are necessary to life. But neither has man changed morally or spiritually. He still has the same desires, the same impulses, the same inclinations as always. All of the moral or immoral things that we read about in the Bible are still present. Things that were there from the time of Adam. Go back and read that 1 Corinthians chapter uh, passage in chapter 6 again about all of those uh, idolaters and effeminate and all of those, and those are prevalent. They're even more prevalent today perhaps than they were 100 years ago. They're still there, man, still the same. He still has those same impulses, those same desires, those same feelings. He still has those same immoral activities that surround him every day. Nothing's changed. If the scripture met needs then, it will meet needs today. Second question, has the world about man changed? Well, outwardly, the answer is yes, the world has changed. But man is surrounded by the same enticing and alluring temptations that man has always faced. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Those things are still wrapped up in everything that man is faced with. In our day. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, where it all began. When God told man that he had created, that he was that he could eat of anything in the garden except the one tree, the tree that stands in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat, and in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And man was fine. Man was there, intended to live forever, and all was well. Until the serpent came. And he enticed Eve. And he said, you'll not surely die. And the Bible says that when the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that it was good to make man wise as God, and then she took and she ate. She gave to her husband and he ate and sin was in place in the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. John said, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. And also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. And so the lust of the, of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life are still those things that surround everything that man deals with today. Those are the same temptations that, that Eve had in the Garden of Eden, and they're just as prevalent today as they were then. And so outward, or the outward man has not changed. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 the Bible says that the devil left him after Jesus quoted scripture. In 
No man in this modern age is, told, uh, is tempted any differently. Only the veneer of the world has changed. Has man's problem changed? And again, the answer is no. It is the, if the disease changed, then there's a need for a change in remedy. But man's problem is sin. Sin that began in the Garden of Eden, and that sin continues even today. It's the same. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Paul said that if, if a man preach any other gospel than that which I've preached unto you, that's wrong. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says that you reap what you sow. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you reap to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll of the Spirit reap righteousness or perfection. In Romans chapter 1, verses 29 to 32, there is a passage that is very familiar to most of us. And there it says, being filled with un uh, all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. You know anybody like that? I do. That's the kind of thing that is prevalent in our society today and is getting worse every day. And so that hasn't changed. Man's problem hasn't changed. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, Paul talk, talked about the works of the flesh. And those are listed there. They're very much like those that were listed there in Romans that we just read. And so man's problem is sin. And sin is the same. And the consequence of sin is the same. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 6, 23 and Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Has the devil changed? I don't think so. Is the remedy for sin different? No. Not at all. The remedy remains the same. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And God commended his love to us for it in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, Paul said, you're saved by grace through faith. And in Mark 16 verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Actually, that's verse 16. In Acts chapter 2, Verses 37 and 38, on the day of Pentecost, those people cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there are three things in that verse that we need to know about. One is that they are to repent, that is, they're to change their mind, change their attitude, change their direction. And then they're to be baptized, but they're to be baptized in water, immersion in water, what the word means. They're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're to be baptized for or in order to receive the remission of sins. No other baptism will work. Paul said there's one baptism in Ephesians chapter 4, and that one baptism is baptism in water for the remission of sins. And the reward of that, of course, is forgiveness of sin. Again, has the devil changed? No, the devil is still going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says that the devil transforms himself into an angel of light, so why should we be surprised if brethren do the same thing? In Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus said there will be wolves in sheep's clothing that will come in among you. False prophets. He said the world is full of false prophets. Some of those false prophets are those that we read from a little bit earlier. In Wineskins Magazine and some other places. But Jesus said every plant that my Heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. If the blind lead the blind, they'll fall into the ditch. Matthew 15, verses 13 and 14. Do we need a new gospel for a new age? Not at all. Customs and methods change. There is new technology. There are new resources. 
those need to be used. We need to change in that respect. We do not argue that some of these things could and perhaps should be changed. But it's still necessary for sinners to hear the gospel, to obey the gospel in order to be saved from sin. And thus, we will continue to teach and to preach the unchanging Christ. The same yesterday, today, yea, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. He's still the bread of life. He is still the door of the sheep. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by him. He is the light of the world. Uh, John 8 and verse 12. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and following. Paul said, If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, I will say again, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, the Bible says that he who adds to the words of this prophecy will have added to him the plagues that are in this book. And he who takes away from the words of this prophecy shall have his place removed from the book of life, or from the tree of life. We do not need a new gospel. We do need to go back and hold to the gospel as God gave it. As for the idea, and just in closing, as for the idea that those churches who hold to the old-time gospel are fading away and are going to disappear, that is an absolute untruth. Brother Alan Hires has written an article and some research, and he says, Churches of Christ that are conservative. He lists one who in 2000 had 1,200 members now averaging 1,300. Another had 1,100 in 2002 and now are averaging 1,250. Another in 2000 had 490 or now averaging 507 or 570. And still another that in 2000 was 1,425 or now averaging 1,731. Conservative churches holding to the old-time gospel are growing. On the other hand, some who have undergone change in one in 1998 that had 3,006 now has 1,700. Another that in 2000 had 540 now has 375. Still another that in 2000 had 775 now has 450. Now that tells me that those who are holding to the old time gospel are the ones that are growing. They're the ones that are adding to their numbers rather than those who are going through all manner of change. We need Jesus Christ and his gospel. It's still the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. <laughs> If you're here this morning, we challenge you to accept that old-time gospel. That old-time gospel that says Jesus died for your sins. That old-time gospel that says that we must reenact his death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized, by repenting and being baptized for the forgiveness of sin, to have those sins washed away, to become new creatures, to rise, to walk in newness of life. And in Christ, all things are become new. That old-time gospel that says that we must live for Him, that we must serve, that we must worship, that we must be committed 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, putting off that old man, putting on the new, striving to keep all things new in him. You're here this morning and you need to submit yourself to him in any way, whether by obedience to the gospel or whether just a submission as a Christian to be a Christian and only a Christian. Then we challenge you to come as we stand together and sing the song of